Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this talk. Uh, each year, uh, about 100 papers get written uh, based on AIM uh, workshops and squares, and you can actually find all of them uh, on our preprint list on our uh, AIM website. And uh, when those papers get published, then they become eligible for uh, the Alexanderson Award that we give each year. And they remain eligible for three years. And a committee from our scientific board selects one paper uh, each year. And uh, this year, um, the award went to um, Kaiza Matamoku, Maxime Rajivi, Terry Tao, um, Tamara Ziegler, and our next speaker, Yoni Teravainen. And <coughs> Yoni will tell us a little bit about uh, the work that uh, led to this paper. Yoni got his PhD in 2018 from Kaiza uh, at Turku, Finland. Uh, his advisor was uh, Kaiza Monomoku that I just mentioned is one of the uh, co-authors on the paper. He uh, was a postdoc uh, at Oxford and a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. <coughs> and currently he is the Marie Curie Fellow uh, at, uh, at Turku, back in, back in Turku. And, um, oh shoot, I thought the slide was gonna have the title. Uh, and uh, Yoni will talk to us today about uh, uniformity of the Mobius function in short intervals. Uh, please welcome Yoni. Thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction. And it's a great honor to be speaking here and to be receiving this award. So I'll talk about the uniformity properties of the Möbius function, which is a topic we made progress on um, in our work at AIM, um, together with Kaiser Matamaki, Maxim Rajivi, Terry Tao, and Tamar Ziegler. And towards the end of the talk, I'll also mention some uh, very recent developments on this topic after our work. Okay, so let's start by defining the Möbius function. So this is a function on the natural numbers, taking values plus, minus one, and zero, given by um, mu of one equals one, and mu of n is minus one to the k, when n has k different prime factors, and mu of n is zero otherwise. So for example, mu of 30 is minus one, because 30 is two times three times five, so the definition of the Möbius function is quite simple, but it turns out many deep properties and open questions about the primes and integers can be encoded into this function. For example, the Riemann hypothesis can be shown to be equivalent to um, the sum of mu of n over n to the s being convergent for any s with real part greater than a half. And one very fascinating thing about the Möbius function is what's called the Möbius randomness principle. So this was introduced in a famous book of Ivanis and Kowalski, and it was further um, made more precise by Sarnak later. So roughly speaking, it says that the Möbius function should very much look like a random variable. So it should be like a random sequence of plus minus one and zero um, with no obvious structure to it and no correlation with any structured object. Now, of course, that's a very um, general statement, which is not precise at this uh, formulation. Uh, later on in this talk, I'll give you uh, precise interpretations of this conjecture, of which there are many. Um, but um, let me first show you the following plot, which maybe gives empirical evidence for why you would expect the Möbius function to be random. Um, so here I plotted the partial sums of the Möbius function up to um, 50,000. So the sum of n up to x of the Möbius function where x goes up to 50,000. And you can see it looks quite a bit like a random walk. So you have uh, roughly the same amount of time that the partial sums are positive and negative and the peaks are roughly of the size of square root of the length 
of this sign. Okay, so at least based on this picture, it looks like there's some randomness in the Möbius function. And before making that precise, let me state a few key properties of the Möbius function. So firstly, it's easy to verify that the Möbius function is multiplicative, meaning that mu of m times n is mu of m times mu of n whenever m and n are co-prime. In fact, the Möbius function is perhaps the most important example of a multiview function. Now, another property is that it's not too difficult to compute the probability or the density of indices n for which mu of n is non-zero. So this turns out to be six over pi squared. In other words, it's the density of the square free numbers. And this is a simple computation, which in the end boils down to Basel's problem. So the sum of one over n squared which is pi squared over six. Now, the mean value of the Möbius function is zero. So if you look at the sum of mu of n, and you take the average, go into infinity, it converts it to zero. And this is in fact equivalent to the primary theorem um, about the asymptotic for the number of primes. And what this means is that both the value plus one and minus one are taken with equal probability by the Möbius function, as you would expect if this was truly a random process. So both values are taken with probability three over pi squared. Okay, so now we have this function that takes values plus one and minus one, each with probability three over pi squared and zero otherwise. And the question is, in what ways can we formalize the statement that this function should be random? And there are in particular three notions of randomness that I want to discuss in this talk. Um, as it turns out, they're all related for non-trivial reasons. So the first way to say that your sequence is random if it takes values plus minus one and zero would be to say that the value at the point n and the value at the point n plus one should be independent. So your sequence should sort of forget its own history. And in other words, if you look at the correlation of mu of n and mu of n plus one, this should converge to zero, as x goes to infinity. So this is known as Charles conjecture. And another way to say that your sequence is random would be to say that, first of all, the sequence is not of low complexity in any sense. And more strongly, it should be orthogonal to anything that's of low complexity. So there should be no correlation with anything which is um, not very complex. In other words, the Möbius function should be orthogonal to any plus minus one sequence, which is a so-called deterministic sequence. So I'll define this in a moment. And this conjecture is known as Sarnak's conjecture. And the third notion of random, randomness I want to mention is if you look at the Möbius function along linear patterns. So um, if you look at k-term arithmetic progressions weighted by the Möbius function, and you take the average of the Möbius function along these k-term progressions, then that's what converts to zero. So this is saying that the Möbius function is unbiased along arithmetic progressions. So this is known as the Gauss uniformity of the Möbius function. So later on I'll tell more about what this means, what, what are the Gauss norms. Okay, so we have these three notions of randomness. The first is number theoretic, Charles conjecture. Sarnas conjecture can be interpreted as statement in dynamics. And the final statement is more combinatorial. Um, and now I'll tell you a little bit about each of these uh, notions of randomness and finally how they relate and how we can make progress on some of them. Okay, so Charles conjecture, as I said, it's about the independence of consecutive values of the Möbius function. So 
more generally, you don't have to take two values. You could take any k number of values and look at um, the values of Mobius function at n plus h1 up to n plus hk, and these should be independent of, of each other. So that's the general formulation of Charles' conjecture. And an equivalent way to state this in a bit more probabilistic way is to say that for any given k, the probability that all of n plus one up to n plus k have an even number of prime factors should be two to the minus k, which is the product of the probabilities that isotomis has an even number of prime factors. So for example, n plus one should have uh, both an even number of prime factors with probability 25%. So this is essentially saying that the Mobius function should behave like a Bernoulli random variable. Now, Charles' conjecture remains open, but in the past decade, there have been several advances on this problem, starting with the work of Matamaki, Razivi, and Tal. In 2015, they proved an average version of this conjecture, where you average over h1 up to hk. And also in 2015, Tal made another advance by showing that the k equals two case of Charles' conjecture holds. Um, there's a small caveat that it should be with logarithmic weights on the sum, so you would add the weight of one over n to the sum and renormalize it, but I'm going to ignore that in this talk. Um, in fact, in a later work with Terry, we relax this um, need for logarithmic averaging a bit. And two years later, with Terry, we proved the odd order cases of Charlotte's connector. So if the number of shifts k is odd, then Charles' connector holds, again with logarithmic averaging. And a further piece of evidence for this conjecture is that Savin and Schusterman verified the function field analog of this conjecture. Okay, so this was roughly the state of the art on the conjecture when we started the um, collaboration at AIM. Um, so in particular the cases k at least four and k being even remain open. Okay, so then we move on to Sarnas conjecture. So um, more precisely, it's stating that the Mavis function is orthogonal to any plus or minus one valued deterministic se sequence. In fact, the sequence could be taking complex values, uh, but for now I'll just concentrate on plus or minus one valued sequences. Um, and what does it mean for a sequence to be deterministic? Well, um, if a single sequence is taking plus minus one values, then a simple way to state that it's deterministic is to say that the sequence has few sign patterns. In other words, if you look at um, all the length k patterns that you see in the sequence of plus minus ones, well, this number can be at most two to the k, but if the number of different patterns of length k that you see is less than exponential in k, then we say that A is deterministic. And an equivalent, more dynamical way of stating that your sequence is deterministic is to say that if you interpret it as a point in the space plus minus one uh, to the power of the indices, and you take the metric space, which is uh, the topological closure of the shifts of this um, A interpreted as a point in the space, then this topological dynamical system, x comma t, has zero topological entropy. Okay, so um, Sanders conjecture has been studied intensively in the algorithm theory literature, and there's a lot of different results about it. I'll mention only a couple of them, uh, which is, there are many other interesting results, but starting with some simple cases. So if A is such the constant sequence one, then Sun's conjecture boils down to the primary theorem, as I stated earlier. Um, if A n is a complex exponential, or more generally, um, an exponential with a polynomial phase, 
And this is also a very classical work from almost 100 years back. The case of A of M being a more general, what's called a bracket polynomial. So you take, take also floor functions of polynomials. Um, it's due to Green and Tal. In fact, this is an example of what's called a Neal sequence, and they prove that Neal sequences are orthogonal to the Möbius function. And in 2019, McNamara proved that the Möbius function is orthogonal to anything which is less than quadratic word complexity for the number of patterns. Okay, so that's a rough overview of standard conjecture. Um, as I said, there are also many other results. Now, but what about the third conjecture about counting algebraic progressions? So there's a concept called the Gauss norm, which appears here. So let me first motivate how that arises. So how can you count k term progressions weighted by a function? Well, if you're looking at three term progressions, this is quite easy. So um, if you're looking at three term progressions weighted by f, such by basic Fourier analysis, so uh, the orthogonality relations, you can bound this by the Fourier norm of f. However, when you have four term progressions and longer, it's known that the Fourier no norm no longer suffices. You need something stronger to control these averages. And the something stronger is called the Gauss norm of f, which is this UKX norm of f. So it depends on k and depends on x, which is the length of the integral. And in a moment, I'll state what these Gauss norms are, but um, the important property is that if you look at these averages over um, k plus one term angular progressions of the function f, they are bounded in terms of the UK Gauss norm of the function f. Okay, so what are the Gauss norms? Well, if you have a function on the integers with finite support, the unnormalized Gauss norms are given as follows. So the U1 Gauss norm is just the absolute value of the sum of your function. The U2 Gauss norm, this is a kind of average of uh, sort of two dimensional parallel pipettes weighted by your function f. And more generally, the UK Gauss norm is an average over k dimensional parallel pipettes of your function. And then if you have a function defined on an interval, the interval Gauss norm is defined as taking this unnormalized Gauss norm of f times the indicator of the interval and normalizing by the Gauss norm of the indicator of the interval. Okay, uh, I'll just mention a couple of important properties of the Gauss norm. Firstly, it's indeed a norm when k is at least two. And secondly, it's increasing in the k aspect. So um, the UK norm is less than the UK plus one norm, which means that they, as k increases, it's harder and harder to bound these norms. Okay, so um, in 2012, Green Tower Ziegler showed that the Möbius function is Gauss uniform, meaning that if you take the UKX Gauss norm of the Möbius function, it converts into zero as x goes to infinity. And this was a key ingredient in their work on linear equations in the primes. So given this, one can ask more strongly about what about uniformity of the Möbius function in short intervals? So if you take the Gauss norm over a short interval, and in fact, um, Tau formulated this conjecture, which I call the high order uniformity conjecture. And it states that for any k and for any function h that tends to infinity, if you look at the uk Gauss norm of f uh, of mu um, over the short interval from x to x plus h, then on average over x, this converts to zero. So it's saying that almost all, for almost all intervals, the UK Gauss norm of Möbius 
over the shortened rule is small. And a couple of things to note. One is that the long interval case, so h equals x, follows from the green tau Ziegler result. And the case of k equals one, so if you look at the u1 Gauss norm of Mobius, this is the Matomaki Vasavia theorem. And finally, so if you don't like the formulation of Gauss norms, this can also be stated, uh, at least the model case of this can be stated in terms of Fourier analysis. So um, essentially, as a model case, what you want to prove is that if you look at exponential sums of the Mobius function twisted by polynomials, and for every short interval, you take the worst possible polynomial of degree at most k minus one, then typically these exponential sums are small. Okay, so that's the higher order uniformity conjecture. And so at the AIM workshop, we wanted to um, make progress on these three conjectures. And our starting point was a very interesting equivalence by Tau, which is that actually all of these three conjectures are equivalent. Um, so they should be inter interpreted with logarithmic averages, but I'll just ignore that fact. Um, and so we wanted to make some progress on the Chowla and Sinai conjectures, and it turns out that this high order uniformity conjecture, although it's more complicated to state, it's easier to make progress on because one can use the machinery of higher order for analysis to approach it. And so that was our starting point for our work. And what we managed to prove about the higher order uniformity conjecture is that um, it holds for any k for intervals of length at least x to epsilon. So we proved the higher order uniformity conjecture for intervals of polynomial length. And if you look at the model case that I mentioned earlier, this would in particular be saying that the short exponential sums of the Mobius function twisted by e to the two pi i alpha n to the k are small uniformly over alpha on almost all short intervals. And this is a statement that was earlier proved for k equals two by Mat Matomaki, Razavi, and Tau. Okay, so um, this is our result. And then we want to ask, okay, so given that we made some progress on the higher order uniformity conjecture, can this be translated to progress on the Shaolin and Sana conjectures? And we managed to obtain a couple of applications so we got a new average version of Charles conjecture, and we managed to um, get bounds on the word complexity of the Liouville sequence, which is defined as the um, minus one to the total number of prime factors of n. Okay, um, so the application to averages states that if you look at um, the correlations of mu at the points h to h up to kh, and you average over h up to x to the epsilon, then um, for typical h, this correlation is small. So um, this um, is, in a way, um, so the earlier result of mathematical regression and tau about averages of the um, Total connector required k different averaging variables, whereas here we only require one averaging variable. And the application to bed complexity um, states that if you look at the number of different length k patterns in the Liouville sequence, so denote this by s of k, then we managed to prove that the number of patterns grows super polynomially in K. Um, so if we had Salos conjecture, then 
e substitute to decay different patterns of length k would appear. Um, and we improved on earlier work, which was um, quadratic lower bound for this complexity. Um, okay, um, I'll just very briefly say about um, some of the ideas that go into the proof. Um, so if we look at this special case of the Mebius function not correlating with exponential phases in short intervals, um, the starting point of the argument is that suppose this average was not converging to zero, then you could say that uh, for many values of little x, there's some uh, value of alpha x which makes this exponential sum large. And we wanted to analyze the structure of this function alpha of x. So using the multiplicativity of the Mervis function, one can derive a functional equation for this alpha of x. And this functional equation can be approached by using methods of graph theory. So in particular, um, we proved that a certain graph is an expander graph, and this allows us to determine that any solution alpha of x to this functional equation takes a very specific form. And finally, we could rule out alpha of x being of this special form by using the mathematical residue theorem. Okay, so um, I skip the details, but uh, Finally, I want to tell about some um, further directions on the questions of uniformity of the Mervis function. So one natural question that arises given the result of uh, Grintown and Ziegler about the Gaussian uniformity of the Mervis function is that can we say something about the rate of convergence of the Gauss norm to zero? And so we addressed this problem together with Terry uh, in 2021. So we gave the first quantitative bound on the UK Gauss norm of the Mervis function, showing that it decays at least like um, double logarithmically in X. And uh, so the original work of Grintown Ziegler was qualitative, uh, but using some um, an inverse theorem of manners and and analysis of Ziegler zeros, we managed to make it quantitative. And very recently, uh, last year, a student of Tau, James Lang, managed to improve our result for K at mod four by showing that um, the U4 uh, Gauss norm of Mobius decays polar logarithmically. Now, another um, that's the question to ask is, given that we could give bounds for the uniformity of the Mervis function, can we also give bounds for the uniformity of the primes in short intervals? Um, so the Mervis function and the primes are related, but in some sense the primes are harder to work with. Um, so in 2012, uh, 2022, uh, together with Matamakitao and Shao, we managed to prove a result about the uniformity of the von Langl function, which is a weighted indicator of the primes in short intervals. So um, we showed that if you have intervals around x of length x to the five over eight plus epsilon, then in almost all such intervals, um, the primes are Gauss uniform. So um, this was generalizing the earlier work of Quintan Ziegler which handled the case of uh, the primes being Gauss uniform over lo long intervals. Uh, and recently, there was an application by Kutsoyanis and Sinas of this result to a problem in algorithm theory um, about uh, positive density sets containing algorithmic progressions uh, with step of the form floor of P to the C, where P is a prime. And Finally, a uh, very interesting question is, can we lower the length of the interval in our result about the high order uniformity conjecture? 
So that would have potentially applications to uh, Charles connector. So uh, Miguel Walsh had a very interesting series of papers on this topic. So firstly in 2021, uh, 20, uh, 21, yeah, uh, he gave a simple proof of the um, result of Madame Kivarsi and Tao about the um, U2 Gauss uniformity of Mervidus. And we believe this could be extended to give also a simpler proof of our result about the UK Gauss uniformity in intervals of polynomial length. Um, then in other work, he managed to lower the value of H further to essentially e to the square root of log X, which turns out to be uh, a somewhat natural barrier in this problem. And finally, in the third work last year, he managed to further reduce the length of the interval, assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Um, and uh, it would be very interesting to extend these results about the U2 uniformity, also the high orders of uniformity. Um, and I believe something like this um, might be possible using um, some additional ingredients from high order for analysis. Um, okay, that's um, all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yoni, for a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, there's a couple mics uh, in the aisles if you want to um, uh, go to a mic to ask a question. It'll probably record better. Questions? Hi. So you mentioned that the three conjectures initially formulated were actually like shown to be equivalent? Yeah, that's right. Is there a like a kind of simple way to show the equivalence between two of them? Um, so the relation between, um, so Charles' conjecture implying Sanders' conjecture was shown earlier by Peter Sarnak. So um, yeah, um, there's actually several different ways to do it. Uh, one is to um, uh, kind of a combinatorial way of sort of um, looking probabilistically what it means for um, a sequence to be orthogonal to deterministic sequences and kind of using a moment method computation to uh, relate this to um, correlations of the Mervish function. Um, so that's one of the equivalences. Um, and then Tao proved that also Sanders conjecture is equivalent to the higher order uniformity conjecture. Um. Thank you. So you mentioned a couple of quantitative bounds on the Gower's norms for the Mobius function. I wanted to ask how good do we expect these, or how, how quickly do we expect these Gower norms to decay, and are there any kind of natural barriers in these methods? So probably we, we would expect even square root cancellation, like for the partial sums. There's no reason not to expect um, very good cancellation, um, like for a random sequence. Um, but uh, of course, we can't prove, even under the Riemann hypothesis, we don't know how to prove such strong bounds, but they should still be true. Thank you. Hi, thanks a lot for the very beautiful talk. I have a question that might be naive. Um, is Chaula's conjecture related to Chaula's conjecture on the non-vanishing of L functions, quadratic L functions at the central point? Uh, no, it's a very different conjecture. It's very different. So I think Chaula okay. made a lot of conjectures. Uh, <laughs> no, no, so I know, I know, but I was wondering, I was trying to yeah. kind of yeah. put together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? All right, let's thank uh, Yoni for a very nice talk. <laughs> <laughs>